Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! We have inevitably been viewing the nascent Trump presidency and the New World Order, many believe it will presage, from a uniquely British perspective. So, let's have a little look now at how it appears from elsewhere in the world. What I'm seeing is that America becoming more protectionist and becoming more nationalist. They're withdrawing from global trade and global agreements. And at the same time, China taking up that position. And President Xi was at Davos to give a speech and stating that China's desire and China's effort going to um, take the leadership on global trade, which will be for the prosperity and peace of the world, and also taking the lead on climate change. If it's um, business deals, renegotiating trade deals, uh, cancelling them, uh, amending them, that's one thing. If it's going to be a projection of military power again, then that's going to be very uh, dangerous. But of course, from Mr. Trump's, uh, President Trump's first utterances, it appears that he realizes those dangers. The European partners are very much in doubt uh, whether the United States will continue to be a, a trustful ally um, in, in NATO. Um, and then, uh, fundamentally, I think it's important to emphasize that in his inauguration speech, he hasn't emphasized the value of human rights, of democracy, of liberal order, which is really, again, another fundament of, of the global order as we, we have built it together with the United States. And his, his brief comments on torture just prove that he is ready to really question fundamental principles. The historian Simon Sharma is here now, alongside Ted Malik, who is widely tipped for a role in the Trump administration, possibly as ambassador to the European Union. You don't have any news for us, do you, Ted, tonight? Uh, maybe next week. OK. Um, we'll start with you, Simon. You've taken to social media uh, and coined uh, the, the rhyme Teresa via Pisa. Anything in today's events to appease your fears? No, not particularly. I, I did, um, no, I mean, the spectacle of them holding hands, actually, um, which doesn't in any rational way <laughs> speak to your question, James, did turn my stomach somewhat, actually. Well, we don't um, know. We don't know that it didn't turn hers, but, but I know the sort of fear that she's cozying up to a regime that may prove to be, well, it, it, uh, as a historian, that may prove to stand comparison with other 20th century horrors. Uh, are you stepping no, back? I, I think, no, I think... Um, Scary authoritarian regimes, not to um, uh, inaccurately paraphrase Count Leo Tolstoy, are scary and authoritarian each in their own way. And I think this is starting to look incredibly scary and authoritarian, um, uh, particularly actually banning the possibility of the um, Environmental Protection Agency delivering data to the public. Um, the, uh, all, all sorts of things, I think, are serious but the most worrying part of all which is not doesn't speak to the authoritarian issue but something loopier is president trump's contact or lack of contact with reality today he doubled down on this extraordinary assertion that between three and five million illegal immigrant votes were cast it's absolutely and this was actually delivered to a reception in which the first reception he had from congressional leaders were treated to a harangue on this entirely fantastic story for which there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever. Okay, hold he, is, he, is, he, is, he is starting an investigation into an election he won. Yes. This, this is beyond uh, there's, absurd. There's, there's, there's three adjectives there then that, that, that I'll pick up on. Absurd is the first, but scary and authoritarian, I think, are the other two. Do you, do you recognise what Simon no, Sharma described? None, none of the above. Uh, 
I mean, where would you like me to start? Well, let, mean, let's start with let's start with the voter fraud allegations. He, he, he's sort of alleging that the Democrats managed to swing three million illegal votes, but not put any of them in the places that would have swung the election. So let's have an investigation. And if there's hard evidence, and there's supposedly some people who have some evidence, and if there's more investigation, there's one, there's one some of this on the video front. has evidence. It's Greg Phillips. Well, we'll, we'll see but what evidence there is. You have the investigation. Yeah. You arrive at you arrive at the conclusions well, afterwards. Well, an investigation into claims of widespread voter fraud. It hasn't happened yet, but he said he was going to do it, so we're waiting. Our next guest first tweeted the claim that three million people voted illegally on November 11th. That's Greg Phillips. He tweeted, completed analysis of database of 180 million voter registrations, number of non-citizen votes exceeds 3 million, consulting legal team. Now, two days later, he sent another tweet. We have verified more than 3 million votes cast by non-citizens. We are joining at True the Vote to initiate legal action. Hashtag unrigged. Those tweets went wild. They were disseminated by many right-wing sites. They became, apparently... A source for Donald Trump's voter fraud beliefs. Greg Phillips joins us now. If you won't show me your method and means and analysis. Whether you believe it or not doesn't mean that it's not true. Whether you have the information or not doesn't mean that I don't have the information. Right, but if truth you can't prove truth, but if you're respected, right? right? Right. Uh, Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. You're not allowing the second part of that equation because you haven't put out the information and you're doing it to the disadvantage of a lot of Americans who want to know the answer to this. There's three million people's um, uh, own veracity on whether or not they're citizens in the balance here. We're not going to make a mistake. But that's we're going to do you. this. We're doing it. But you already accused them. Look, I'm not a politician. I'm just a guy. No, we're follow, we're, I know, follow, but you we're know, volunteers, that's, that's, But that's, that's an excuse. That's a convenience. You put it out there, got by all these righty sites. It made its way to the president. He's now putting it forth as truth. you got to show what you know. We will. But when? When the time's right. What does that mean, when the time is right? The time is right right now. That's why we're here. You, I just bump into you in the hallway. You came here to talk about this. Look at it this way. The technology exists for the federal government right now, mm -hmm. today, to match this data out and give us the answer, right? I don't know. Homeland, that. The Department of Homeland Security has the information. They can match it against the voter file, and they can give us one thing. I don't know that anything you're saying is true. Maybe. I don't know that they know who every non-citizen is who voted illegally in the United States. They will as soon as they make the match. And as soon as Attorney General Sessions orders that be done and... Well, hold on. And, so are you and, saying you're waiting for somebody else to do something so they'll know the yeah. answer? Because I'm not waiting on the government I'm just saying to tell it's, me. I'm saying it's easier for them. For us, it's tedious. But what I'm saying is, look, either you know or you don't. What I'm hearing from you is you think you'll be able to show it. No. What you're hearing is that, that I know... You just don't believe that I know. Well, why would I believe it if you don't show how you know it? Come on, I mean, this is a, this is a very silly simple circle that we're going in sure. here right now. You say you can prove it. I say, okay, sure. I trust you. You can prove it. Show me. You we say, will. I will, but you're not. We you, will. Can you give me an estimated date? We, we believe that, that it, it will probably take another few months to get this done. And yet... Even though you need a few more months to get it done, you think you know the answer right now. We're volunteers. We know we have the answer. Even though you can't prove it, you think you know. The number's actually bigger. Well, whatever. You can say the number is whatever it is. You have to show it. One other question. You put this out in the beginning of November. The states didn't certify until after that. I think Vermont was one of the few ones that came out four days after you. Sure. So you couldn't have done it off certified voter returns because right. you wouldn't have had them. Possibility of right. fact. So that means you must have based it on early voting returns. Is that a safe assumption? Uh, in part. Because you can't do it off the certified counts because you didn't have them when you put out the tweet. But, but you, they're, they're, well, there's all sorts of ways, as you, you guys know about get out the vote, right? I mean, one of the ways that you do it is you have poll watchers there waiting to see who signs in. That's whoever, not precise. And whoever doesn't sign in, then you go get them. That's not precise. We are as precise as we need to be. More than three million non-citizens voted in this country in this election. We're prepared to prove it. We need a little more time. The president, should he choose to, can ask his attorney general and the Department of Homeland Security to make that match on a dime, make the decision. We don't have to do the work. You don't have to well, believe no, you it. You have to do you the can work. Believe the you government. have to do it, Greg, because you can't say, I know this is true. Let's have them prove it. We're doing it. This is on you. We're doing it as and fast you, as we can. Right, but you already said you had the answer. You we understand do. what I'm saying? We do. But you understand that logically that doesn't go together. 
If I know the answer to something, it's because I've concluded my process of analysis, not because I'm in the middle of it. Not necessarily. You, 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 can, you can reach a conclusion and then still verify. You can still go back but and then double how do you check know that you're and check. Right? That's exactly what we're doing. We're going back and, and shouldn't you have waited right? to say that you know for sure no. before you were sure about no. it? The other side of it is, so I'm a tweet. I mean, people say lots of things. People said I was a Russian spy. Who cares what they say? Right? I only care about the facts. Right. And we have all these studies that have looked at all of these things. If you care, the, if the you professors care. that you put out there say, no, this is who Trump is listening to. It's not us. They've been debunked by Wait. the guys who developed their data. Wait, Chris, I didn't put any professor out there. You said, I think Trump is referring to these two guys uh, from George Mason University, those professors who put out a study. You're quoted as saying that. No. I did not. So somebody just put those words in your Absolutely. mouth? Absolutely. Oh. All right. Well, that's another problem then, right? Maybe. No, then you obviously state the conclusions. Yeah. I mean, that's what investigations are. We have investigation into Russian hacking, and then we find out what the truth is. I mean, uh, hopefully just, we have actually some empirical evidence about these things that one can look at. Rather than dismiss them out of hand at the beginning, why not look at them? Indeed. Even, I, even I on mean, the liberal left, they were willing to look at I, actual facts. Empirical evidence, I, I mean, obviously it's a bit I'm a social a, scientist, you, so I prefer data. Clearly, so except when climate change is on the table. Yeah, well, there are people who have different points of view on climate on, change. So we were talking about empirical data a minute ago. No, we are, but oh, okay. I mean, there are about 10%, I'm told, let, of hard scientists let, let, who let, have let, some questions about some of that data. Of course. Data. Let, 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 me, let me just draw the conversation out, if I may, and, and look at whether or not you feel, as, as someone who clearly Donald Trump holds in high regard, that we are at a, in some sense, whether you're worried about it like Simon Sharma is or whether you're not like you are, are we at a p pivotal point in, in Western history here? I think we are, we are at a turn in Western history. Obviously, we've, we've had a, a change from one regime to another regime, so you have that. But you also have a more national-oriented, a more populist-oriented uh, political cast, so that's coming into play. And that's not just in the United States. Frankly, it's in many countries around the world. So if that's the case, then maybe a new order is beginning to appear. The nationalist, populist, they're not new ideas, are they? Well, they're and new they, in they this form and they're new in this time. Right. Yes, have we seen all, I mean, frankly, are there any new ideas since Plato? I mean, we could have that debate, but... But yeah. we're not. Huh? <laughs> but we're not. So, you I mean, nationalism, me, if you nationalism like. and populism rarely, rarely, rarely lead to harmony. Lead to harmony. Well, I mean, there, there are different kinds of nationalism, different kinds of populism. I mean... Uh, well, do, America do, first, you know, let's take that slogan, really. It takes an absolutely jaw-dropping So do you know who history. used the term first? Pardon? Do you know who used the term first? Well, it was B. I. Wilson. Which Wilson? Fine, Wilson I know, but it, it was first. reprehensible when Wilson used ah, it. See, it was yeah. unbelievably well, reprehensible. Well, maybe when Lindbergh used it, it was more Andrew. reprehensible. And how? Actually, Lindbergh was an appeaser. Well, Lindbergh uh, was, you know, soft on the Nazis. Uh, it's an irony that Trump has moved Churchill into back into his office who would have detested and did detest everything about the slogan and what America first stood for. But Let he me just nonetheless needed America to help save Britain at a certain point in time. But Trump probably is not intellectually connected with that wonderful litany we've just talked about in terms of intellectual well, history. He intellectually He's history? interested in literally, literally putting America first, right. of re-establishing America's place in the world, America's economy, I think that's the thing to underscore. He really got elected on a platform that said the middle class has suffered for at least 15 years. So it's not just over the last eight years, but it has suffered and it needs to come back. Well, why is he proposing a tax cut which will benefit hugely and disproportionately the top 1%? Well, certainly you know about supply-side economics. It's worked before. Uh, no, it hasn't worked before. Well, I'm, we can I, have an I'm an economist. It has worked before. It worked for John Kennedy. It worked for Ronald Reagan. And it could work this time. In four years, we could actually have a balanced budget under the best circumstances. What, what, what we about had a balanced this? budget under what? Bill Clinton, yes, actually, we did. Well, not time. under support. I, I mean, I'm and interested Newt Gingrich in... was the head of the Congress, and they did it together, if you recall. I'm interested in this... this distinction between literally and seriously it's been it's been a recurring theme in the program yes. um, you take him seriously but you don't take him literally you, you, you have always taken him literally oh uh, no I, I think you could take him either way and people obviously have in this but entire he's, pre campaign. he's president now he's I mean he's, he's, he's right. not campaigning he's not that, used that's true so there should be some 
difference. You know, when you're president, you step you up seen to any, the game. Have you seen any yet? Well, in five days, I think we are beginning to say, I actually think we saw some of it today no. in Sorry. the meeting and the summit with Theresa May. Ted Malik, thank you. Simon Sharma, finally, are you not seeing any sort of cause for cautious optimism? No. Or a dilution of your pessimism? No. Simon Sharma, Ted Malik, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>